I love The Greatest Showman. Uh, okay, that's a lie. It's a terrible movie. The plot is barely coherent. There's only like four good songs, and most of them don't really work as musical songs anyway. To say P.T. Barnum is a controversial figure would be a bit of an understatement. But I do find something so enthralling about the circus aesthetic. Not that I've ever been to one. For all its many faults as a competently told story, I can't hate the film all that much. It's a piece of pure spectacle media. In that way, it perfectly portrays the institution and person it's depicting. The age of the Victorians is often considered the age when spectacles were, or became, highly important within Western capitalist culture. In Britain, the Victorians loved displays, the Great Exhibition of 1851 being the most emblematic of this, but they ranged from the World's Fair all the way down to provincial museums. Geology, anatomy, consumer goods, imperial plunder, ancient artifacts, historical plays, everything could be up for display. The most egregious example of this fascination with looking was undoubtedly the Freak Show. The Freak Show is a highly controversial topic in our culture and a lot of people assume it to be an inherently exploitative institution. But here we're going to bring a bit more nuance to that discussion. I'm not going to argue that P.T. Barnum was actually a saint, in fact I barely want to talk about him. He's not as interesting to me as how the film presents the freaks. It's not historical obviously, but we're going to have to spend a bit of time considering the historical reality of the freak show. Through this framing, we can then consider how the film has changed this, how it reconceptualizes the freak and what it wants to tell us. That's a bit of a vague description, so I think we best just jump straight into talking about The Freak Show. Throughout this, I'm going to be referring to these people as freaks, which I know might come across as a slightly offensive term. However, it is the best phrase to describe this group as it is the only thing that unifies them. The freak defies modern descriptors because there are many different types of freak. Some were born, having some kind of physical abnormality that might be called a disability these days, Others were made freaks, such as those with large amounts of tattoos. Then there were those who were merely not white. Indigenous people were regularly displayed as freaks, particularly those who had physical abnormalities who could sell the imperial ideas of racial superiority. Which brings us to what the freak meant, and why they're so interesting. Freak is a shortening of freak of nature, though historians have argued they could more accurately be described as a freak of culture. The freak embodied what the society they appeared within saw as abnormal. The category of the freak was thus socially constructed within a specific time and place, hence why there is no modern term which can exactly encapsulate what the freak was. As Robert Bogdan has put it, freak is not a quality that belongs to the person on display. It is something we created, a perspective, a set of practices, a social construction. With that set up, let's get on to a bit of history of the freak and the freak show. The examples of freaks we're going to draw upon appeared both in America and Europe. The examples of freaks we're going to draw upon appeared in both America and Europe. And while the film is focused on America, there is a lot of crossover in freak show culture across the Atlantic. For a long time, people with physical abnormalities had been displayed in fairs and the like, but they weren't the same as the freak show. The distinct freak show culture only appeared in the 19th century. Partly this comes from the improvements in transportation, allowing freak shows to travel huge distances, rather than a freak being limited to wherever they were born. Showmen could recruit from all corners of the earth. The advancement of medicine was also important. The medical community had a lot of interest in those with physical abnormalities, hoping to define these groups and yet lacking the actual technique to properly classify people's conditions until closer to the turn of the century. Rather than resisting science, showmen were more than happy to have doctors come and view their freaks for the very reason that they couldn't categorise them, couldn't define them. These testimonies of their authenticity was a big marketing point. The uncertainty of the freak was crucial because it allowed for various meanings to be projected onto the body. Freaks could often break expected binaries, the bearded woman adopted both masculine and feminine traits, often making sure to play up the femininity in order to draw out this contrast. The bearded woman could perfectly emulate the domestic femininity of Victorian society, whilst having masculine physical features, which is what made them a freak of culture. Freak shows were not a monolithic institution, rather a set of practices that appeared across a range of different shows. The Dime Museum was one of the earliest, popularised, of course, by P.T. Barnum and his American Museum. And of course, the circus was another important institution for freak shows later in the century. And this again was a Barnum endeavour, though let's save Barnum for a bit later. Although freak shows did continue all the way to the 1970s, they were in decline for a long time. It's impossible to pin down a single factor that caused this decline. For one thing, medicine became better at diagnosing people and became more professionalised. Doctors began to object to being used for marketing schemes and insisted they understood what afflicted freaks. The raw material, those with abnormalities who could become freaks, were also declining because of this. More and more they were being institutionalised and kept out of the public eye by the state. There's also the effect of the eugenics movement. Bodily abnormalities were seen as signs of genetic weakness, 
The freak became someone who should be treated with disgust rather than a curiosity that could be observed and enjoyed. All these were factors in the societal change that pushed people away from the freak show. But there was more that changed society throughout the last century, and it's difficult, and maybe not all that important, to know exactly why the practice declined and freak shows became a part of our culture we look back on in shame. But before we condemn the practice entirely, we should consider the freaks themselves. The freak helped society to define itself, to define the normal. Only when you have an outgroup can you conceptualise the ingroup. Freaks were undoubtedly subjects to wider societal forces, which defined the roles they could play. They needed to find a place within society's expectations in order to be popular and profitable. But the creation of the freak was a dialogue, a conversation between the freak and their audience, both in the actual performance and in the advertising. As we've said, the testimonies of doctors, real or otherwise, were often a big part of their advertisement. Advertisements could be seen as lifting up freaks, displaying their talents through their abnormality. When Barnum's Greatest Show on Earth displayed in London in 1889, it advertised legless aerial gymnasts and armless artisans. Freaks who were well known and made lots of money often had a lot of autonomy over their own advertisement, giving them the power to shape their own perceptions. Performances were, of course, the most important place where freaks could shape their identity. Many shows involved directly interacting with their audiences and building a connection that would impact those they saw. Even outside of the shows, they could have distinct impressions on people. Julia Pastrana is a very interesting case study. She was labelled Mexico's bear woman due to a condition that caused her to grow hair all over her body. She toured Europe in the 1850s until her death in 1860. In 1857, she met an English civil servant, Arthur Munby, and her interaction with him unsettled him so much that he would write a poem about her many decades later. In it, she seems to have taunted him, and when they met again later at a dinner party, she left him in cold sweats. When talking to others, though, she was described as warm and engaging. Her ability to shift how she behaved and create different perceptions speaks to someone who was very aware of how she wanted to be seen and knew how to change that. Pastrana had a lot of agency in other ways. She maintained her own space backstage of shows, her charitable donations suggest she had some control over her finances, and she was allowed to make her own clothing, which helped her to shape her perceptions. It's never that simple, of course. Her manager, Theodore Lent, became her husband as well. In isolation, it isn't inherently bad, but this wasn't the first time he'd married one of his performers. From this view, the marriage was almost certainly about pure exploitation to enrich himself. But Pastrana seems to have defended her marriage. She found some legitimate emotional benefit from it. What's more, marriage gave her more social advantages which she lacked as a commoner from a non-Western country. This transitions us into a very important point. While freaks were able to become very profitable and gain independence through that, it tended not to be possible for children, people who weren't mentally competent, or non-Western people. It is an important caveat for the argument of the freaks' autonomy. However, it is important not to fall into the belief that it was inherently exploitative. It's like the argument people use against sex work, that it's selling your body. Freak performers were very much selling their abnormal bodies, selling a view of them as a commodity, but all physical labour demands you sell your body in some way. The capitalist system of work is always exploitative, oftentimes those who became freaks were able to avoid institutionalisation that became more prominent in the 20th century. I'm not going to weigh up which is a better option, but there was clearly more autonomy for people in the freak show than in an institution. Right, well that was kind of heavy. But now we have a better understanding of the freak show. They are a topic of interest to historians partly because they reflect so much of society. They define the in-group and out-groups, define the normal within society. The autonomy of freaks was varied, with some having wealth and influence, while others were children taken from indigenous communities, such as Crow, the missing link. Freak show managers were by no means above lying to audiences, and in many cases people were happy with this, enjoying the art of the trick. So then, let's get on to why you click this video and discuss the film itself. So let's quickly run over the plot of The Greatest Showman. We start on a circus performance only to find out that it's just the dream of a young Phineas Barnum. I can't believe Phineas is a real name, I thought they just created it for Phineas and Ferb. Anyway, he meets Charity and they stay in contact as they grow up, ending up living in a small apartment in New York together with their two children. I realise I'm really rushing this part, but honestly there's a lot of really boring bits in the film I hate and I don't want to think about too much. Notably though, there's that scene where a woman with some kind of facial disfigurement gives him an apple, and it's never mentioned again. Barnum is fired when the firm he works for goes bust. He steals the paperwork for a trade fleet, and uses that to trick the bank into giving him a loan to buy a stuffed animal and waxwork museum. After it fails to bring people in, he starts recruiting freaks to bring people in. Showing his gift as a showman, he quickly devises the freakish personas for these people, such as exaggerating weight, turning a tall man into an Irish giant, and calling a man covered with hair, Dog Boy. The show is a success, 
and Barnum brings in Philip Carlyle to give him credibility and attract an upper-class clientele. Despite ongoing protests, the troupe gets to meet Queen Victoria herself, where Barnum meets the Swedish singer Jenny Lind. He agrees to organise her tour in America, and as he ventures out on this massive money-making scheme, the troupe feels more abandoned by him. When he pushes them out of a party celebrating Lind, they assert their right to be seen in spite of the anger they continue to receive from protesters. Philip and Anne Wheeler, a black trapeze performer, go for a date at the theatre only to meet Philip's parents, who subject them to racist abuse. The tour with Lind falls apart after she comes on to Barnum and he rejects her. When he gets back to New York, he finds the museum has burnt down after the protesters attacked the freaks. Between the fire and the tour ending early, Barnum is left penniless, but he realises the importance of the family he developed with the freaks and vows to do better. With the money Philip saved, they set up the circus again, this time in a tent, and the show is beloved and successful. The end. Sorry if that felt like a bit of an odd rundown. It reflects how the film feels to me though, just scenes happening then it's over. I don't know, it's an odd experience. If I haven't made it clear already, I don't think the film is all that good. There are some genuinely great emotional beats, like I say there are four good songs and they are powerful. It doesn't feel like the film earns that though, they kind of come out of nowhere. I'm not trying to be a film critic here. No, we need to get on to how the film portrays the freaks. So obviously the film is reconceptualising the freak to fit its own message. It barely puts up any pretensions of historicism. For one thing, it's completely unclear when any of this happens. There's this one bit where Barnum looks out of a window and sees what looks like war graves, so maybe they're setting it after the American Civil War? The real Barnum opened his museum before the Civil War. It was burnt down, he went into politics for a bit before getting back into showmanship again, this time in the circus. I suppose politics was a logical application for the skills of the father of advertising. We're not going to simply nitpick the show, but rather point out what the inaccuracies are trying to tell us. Firstly, the freaks are treated as always having full autonomy. When Barnum goes to visit Charles Stratton, aka General Tom Thumb, to recruit him, he states that Stratton is 22. In reality, Stratton was 5 when Barnum first took him on tour. They were also distant cousins, which is like… sure. Stratton would go on to be hugely successful beyond Barnum, and in fact bailed him out when Barnum was in financial difficulties. The film underplays the success that Stratton had without Barnum, but it also completely wipes away any question of exploitation in the relationship. Like I said, all employment may be exploitative, but when your distant cousin trains you to be a performer from a young age, long before you can realistically consent to much, well, that's far worse. In fact, no one Barnum employs is anything other than willing. In some ways, this film is trying to be more positive about the experience of freaks than real life, but in other ways it does seem to invent obstacles for them. Let's talk about the protesters. Their issue with the show isn't exactly clear. They're a mob wielding literal flaming torches. They seem to hate the freaks for the generic reason of hating what is different. Freak is used by them as a purely derogatory term, rather than the more nuanced understanding people at the time would have had. Now, showmen certainly experienced hostilities from local communities when they went touring. It was no infrequent occurrence to be set upon by a party of roughs, who were determined to show their prowess and skill as marksmen, with fists and clubs if required. This violence, however, was not directed at freaks for anything about their freakish nature. Rather, it was a mixture of hatred of the outsider and hatred of a group of people who were coming into your town and were seeking to scam you. And to be clear, showmen were very happy to shortchange people and other small-time grifts like that, beyond the tricks they might pull in advertising a show or a freak. In the film, it's the conflict between the freaks and the protesters that leads to the fire that burns the museum down. In reality, the fire was actually caused by a confederate who was mad that Barnum put on pro-union stuff, which, if anything, makes Barnum come across better than a lot of the movie does. As with sidestepping the issue of agency in the freaks, the movie also sidesteps a lot of the politics of the biggest issue in Barnum's lifetime. They do acknowledge the even greater racism of the time through Philip and Anne's relationship, with Philip's father calling her the help which seems… tame as something a white man would call a black woman in the 1800s? Their romantic subplot is a microcosm of some of the broader themes. Their struggle in some way is to have the courage to be seen together, knowing that society will hate them. When we first meet the bearded woman, she tries to stay hidden from Barnum and by extension the world. Stratton is resistant to Barnum's offer initially, saying that the world will laugh at him. All this fear of the world and how they are seen is overcome in This Is Me. The freaks declare that they are not afraid to be seen. This misses the entire point of freaks, but it does tell us a lot about what the film is saying with them instead. They are a stand-in for anyone who is an outcast of society. Obviously the freaks are those who are physically different, but the language is ambiguous so as to be understood by any marginalised group. Disabled people, queer people, people of colour, many people can understand the meaning of the song, can empathise with the emotions it expresses. The fear that you can't be loved, that you need to hide from the world, that you can't be accepted. The realisation that you're worth all the love in the world. 
that the struggles you've been through can't make you any less important as a person. It is quite the beautiful message, for sure. Of course, here's where I'm going to take some fault with the film. I said earlier, I don't feel like it earns its emotional moments. While the message it tells through the freaks is good, it doesn't spend enough time with them to actually make it land right. Instead, so much of the film is focused on P.T. Barnum. It makes sense, it is about the greatest showman, not the show itself. Maybe it's partly my taste, but the Jenny Lynn stuff is just excruciatingly boring. It pulls the plot towards him reuniting with the freaks and realising he's lost touch with the circus itself, but it's too aggrandising of him. Throughout the film, they reinforce he's kind of the driving force behind the whole thing. While he's gone, the circus doesn't do as well as it had done. As we've discussed, this is not the case historically. Showmanship was a skill for sure, being able to drum up a crowd to watch something that you were exaggerating. That was a fact known between the audience and performers, and the skill of a showman was in part making sure people were happy with that, able to enjoy it. The pleasure of being hoodwinked, as the film puts it. But a showman couldn't sell something people didn't want to see, that didn't engage them in some way. We've already discussed how Stratton went on to be hugely successful without Barnum. After her death, Pastrana's husband had her embalmed and toured her corpse around Europe, but it never had the same attention. The acts themselves were hugely important. Freak isn't an innate trait. It is in part a job. The job of entertaining through some abnormality of the performer. Pastrana was a great singer, charming, the model of femininity despite her physical differences. So for the film to suggest that all the success came from Barnum feels a little disingenuous. Like it's selling the freak short and not acknowledging that they gained fame for their own abilities. It's an able-bodied white man raising marginalised peoples up. When in truth, they did that through their own work. In a way, it would have been a far more empowering story if you pretend that Hugh Jackman was actually playing Wolverine here too. I mean, he would have been alive at this point, and the mutants of X-Men are very obviously queer-coded. See the coming out scene in X-Men 2, but this is getting off topic. Massively. I don't think this ruins the good messaging the story has elsewhere. But I think it is important to note how the story can't see these people pulling themselves up. It's just one of the limits of historical media that you have to stick to reality somewhat, otherwise you might as well just make straight fiction. It is interesting to me still that the film chooses to have the freaks met with violence, rather than curiosity. I think in part it says something to our culture that we presume that those who are different are met with violence. It comes back to a point Bogdan made as well, about how the rise of ideas like eugenics and institutionalization of disabled people moved perceptions from curiosity into disgust and hatred. You know, it would be super interesting to go back over media created over the last, say, 100 years-ish, and see how perceptions of the freak show have changed, see what patterns emerge. Hmm. Oh wait, I could totally do that. Well then folks, join me next time when I watch a load of old media about freaks and try to guess any deeper meaning to it. Okay, great. Bye. Fine, this is an essay of a sort, so we'll have a proper little conclusion. The freak is a complex idea to unravel. The bodies of those abnormal to society became an important place of discussion for society to decide what normal truly was. The freaks often found themselves bridging gaps, masculine and feminine, animal and man, black and white. Society's anxieties around these issues could be turned back on themselves and allow the public to laugh to mitigate them. Whether a freak had autonomy, had genuine agency, is very much a case-by-case -case situation, and so the industry is difficult to paint in a single stroke. Freaks today still provide fertile ground for new discussions, and it is a concept that can be turned into a powerful narrative for those who find themselves rejected by society. I don't think The Greatest Showman fully captures the nuance of the freak show, but nor does it need to in order to tell its narrative. The framing of Barnum as central to the show is problematic in some ways, but the film still doesn't fail to be a stunning spectacle, when it isn't being excruciatingly boring, that is. The use of spectacle is certainly true to Barnum, so it's nice to see something that tells a story by invoking the sensation that is pivotal to the story itself. Hello there, everyone. Hey. <laughs> uh, thanks for watching. Um, be sure to like if you enjoyed it, and uh, if, you're, if you'd like to watch my follow-up video that I'm definitely going to get around to doing, um, looking at freaks in different media, then hit subscribe. Um, yeah. Uh, I d just, to, just to clarify, I, uh, I don't think P.T. Barnum is a good person by any means. Um, I worry that I came off a little too uh, forgiving of him as a person in this, but no, he is a distinctly bad individual who did a lot of bad things, but showmanship as a general practice is more complicated than just him and he also supported the like he was a politician and helped out with the end of slavery so like you know i guess he paid it back in some ways um but no 
not here to judge the morality of people of the past. They're dead, so whatever. Can't cancel P.D. Barnum now. Um, but yeah. <laughs> uh, seriousness aside, yeah, this was a a fun little video to make. I enjoyed doing a bit of research again and reading up on... Because I came into this sort of assuming, oh yeah, I'm going to read it. But like, oh, the, the film's really inaccurate. It's terrible presentation of freaks. But actually, I sort of softened to it as I came along and sort of went, oh yeah. Actually, there's a lot more nuance to how we can look at the freak show. And yeah, I'm not... <laughs> I'm not calling for freak shows to suddenly spring up everywhere. But I think within their own time, they are interesting and they shouldn't just be gone. We shouldn't just go, it was pure exploitation because it was exploitation the way a lot of work is exploitation. Um, anyway, this is rambling on a bit. So yeah, um, yeah, it was fun. Uh, I somehow feel like this isn't going to do as well as my previous video on Hamilton because Hamilton does better than The Greatest Showman because <laughs> this isn't exactly in popular media anyway. This is all a long window way to say, yeah, thanks for watching. Be sure to check out whatever I do next, which, no, I know what I'm doing next. It's going to be all about freaks. Again, it's going to be very exciting, I promise. Okay, thanks for watching. Have that. Stay safe out there. Have fun. Bye.